Doc and Jock podcast. It's me, Doc. Danny, other guys, Coach Show, and the other other guys, James Fitzgerald, also known as OPT, the head of OPEX. Um, probably doesn't need an intro, but uh, we'll let him do a little bit of that and give us a little bit of a of a background for those of you that don't know him. We're super excited to get a chance to uh, to chat with him. Probably one of the smartest coaches out there right now. Um, so, James, for those of those that are listening that aren't familiar with you, can you give him like a super short bio because we want to pepper you with all these great questions that we know you're going to be able to answer. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was a young athlete, um, fell in love with sport and conditioning after an injury, uh, wanted to fall in love with uh, understanding the whole process of the physical specimen and training and conditioning itself. Because after that injury, trying to get back into better shape, I was fascinated by it. So went into academia um, and studied it, uh, and then came out, got into the real world and started practicing it to help other people uh, through fitness and realized there was a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't learn in academia that I had to learn just through the trenches of coaching. Um, and a lot of that is human behavior aspect and aspects of fitness that are all broad and, and uh, does not include a lot of the academic model of what's going to be taught for fitness. Um, and so I practiced my trade, did a lot of training in the trenches for many years, developed some successful businesses and a lot of successful coaches and decided that there was some kind of system that I had in place that helped create success for those individuals. And then I put that together in an education format for people who uh, who want to do some uh, professionalism in fitness coaching. And that's what I do today. I coach coaches around the world within uh, coaching for fitness. And we also uh, offer on-site um, coaching for people who are serious about fitness and those who are online who do the same thing. Very cool. The term that sticks out there is coaching in the trenches, right? And a question that we love to ask coaches who pop on the show is just a kickback to those early coaches who were in the trenches that inspired you. We love hearing those old school stories and we love kicking it to coaches who are actually doing the work, who, who don't get on the internet, who don't have the platform and, and just kick it back to those guys and we'll start talking shop about them. Yeah. Um, you mean you, so I think in your question was about mentors at yeah, the time. When who, who inspired yeah. you to go on that early athletic journey? Yeah, for sure. Um, well I was a, an underground, um, you know, bodybuilder, young man in strength. So I was in strength conditioning because I was in the science aspect. I worked with uh, David Beam, who's a leading researcher in Canada on muscle fatigue. So he put me down that road of like honoring the black and white specifics of uh, science. Um, and uh, so I, I was in that headway. And then I'd come over here and read Muscle Media 2000 and, uh, you know, follow Dan DeShane and more to Pasquale and, and uh, all the, the fathers on T Nation at the time, you know. Um, Charles Poliquin, Ian King, um, Louis Simmons, Dave Tate, um, a bunch of other guys who were really on. There was a crew of, you know, Paul Check. There was, a, you know, at that time. And I, I always uh, really honored this idea that, you know, they really, you know, quote unquote, as from my perspective, I was like, holy shit, you know so much, you know, that they could create answers to these questions. And I could quickly see that they would always finish their stuff with like, you know, without telling me directly, because I worked with a lot of them privately just to kind of stoke up as much shit as possible, um, that you'll see, you know, they finish with like, you'll see as you do the work, right? So it was not like, here's the answers and just don't ask any more questions. They'll like, you'll, you'll see it come to light when you kind of practice it. So those guys always had that, you know, idea uh, given to me that, you know, you can, you could see things right away from the get-go, which is fantastic. But you're also going to have to be in the trenches in order to learn. So, of course, I went away from that as being super excited and trying to develop a business and, and learn as much as I could, right? Well, you talk about being in the trenches and, uh, you know, I, there's uh, the saying when I was in the military is that you, you have to lead from the front, you know. And uh, for you, it seems like you've been there. You still train quite a bit, you know, and are competitive as an athlete. Um, but, uh, you know, you especially – in the documentary, every second uh, counts with uh, with CrossFit. It was interesting to see kind of training methodology that you had within that, and it, it seemed like you were you were kind of ahead of everybody in terms of um, organization of your training versus just doing some random stuff and and uh, relying on um, you know maybe you pick the right thing. Where so when when you talk about these mentors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where where do you find this kind of systemization? And was it was it mainly in the textbooks you learned that, or was that when you were training you were trying to optimize yourself? Yeah, it was, I guess, a combination of both. So I'd looked at, you know, let's just say a textbook of um, principles, let's say through Mel Sif or Zatsky or Ski or Medvedev and say, OK, that kind of makes sense. And then you go over here and go, now, how in the hell that's going to apply to a chaotic, you know, <laughs> environment of all this mixed yeah. shit? And so in my, my gut instinct was like, well, 
I'm going to I'm going to actually do it because if I don't do it, I won't understand it. But as soon as I saw it, I, I saw like, it, you know, as you know, you guys see things differently than I do. Right. So when I looked at that, I purely saw a different method of doing work. So I, I, saw, I had no I had no um, connections to right or wrong or good or bad or, you know, bullshit or not bullshit or, you know, don't do touch and go cleans. But, you know, you should only do them in singles. And, you know, I never had any of that baggage in my head. I just looked at it. I was like, now that's a fucking interesting way to do work. Mm. And so in my mind, based upon those models of let's call it strength and endurance, because really the power model is still very uh, complicated. Um, I, I just tried to apply those, which is like work rest scenarios and, and structural balance and positional strength and like timing and progression of energy systems. And yeah, so that's how I basically looked at it when I saw it. When you bring up the interesting way to do work and, and we've, we've noticed the evolution of CrossFit since those first games to where we're seeing now. And, and we talked with CJ Martin in our last release about the, the exponential growth in volume and, and where the sport's going. Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit now about just kind of witnessing this growth in the sport, you know, from this 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 activity where folks got together and would test themselves to now it's this sport where folks are earning paychecks, they're doing well, sponsorships are getting involved, and and your th general thoughts there on the blend of work and fitness and sport and, and how that all kind of comes together. Yeah, two pieces in there. So bring me back at the end if I don't connect that fitness sport thing. That's sure. the biggest part of the conversation I'd like to hit on. Um, remember that we didn't we didn't do it just get as get togethers. Uh, the sport was you by yourself in your gym. You know, it was on dot com and you did it, you know, wherever over the world, or you did it through a website that was like trying to beat these other people with this one specific workout. Um, and it wasn't until really whoever it was made the decision that money could be made on the scaling of that aspect, that it turns into gyms and then certifications and then the growth of that. Remember where it came from was just like an idea and a workout online that anyone could do in their garage gym. So um, when we first, when I first started doing it, there was never really any thought of that as to what it actually looks like today. But when we competed at the games for the first time in Aromas, I told uh, my training partner at the time who went down there and competed with me, um, that this is going to be like gladiators in Vegas, you know, cause we, we, we sense the, and that's basically what it is. You know, it actually, in Carson, if you go there on Sunday night, that's exactly what it looks like. It's a, it's an arena surrounded by, you know, raving fans who know the culture, know the sport. Um, and these people are just going at it in this little circle, you know? So I kind of sense that would be the case because of like what, what happened that day. It's almost like we finished but there was this like energy around, we haven't even touched like the, the top of what this is going to turn into. And the reason why we knew that is that at the time uh, for, you know, the days we left, cause we all kept connected online. Even if people didn't come to Rome at the time, everyone was like, what happened? Like, how did it all go? And we could just sense the energy around it was, was uh, tremendous. And then of course they're like, we got to do a movie on this. We got to make it, you know, we got to make it marketable. We got to show stories. We got to create this, you know, effect of the sport in itself. And that's what led us to the, as CJ probably concluded, this massive growth uh, to today and uh, it being it really turning into a sport. I, I did actually remember the point on fitness and sport. If go. that's <laughs> if, if one of the things, if one of the things CrossFit could have done um, if, you know, and it, that's just my own views on it, where I sit in coaching education as well as coaching of fitness and the professionalism of coaching and like where it sits today um, is that this, the, the, there was a major missing piece that they connected sport and fitness together and they're two completely different things. And you know, the, the, uh, and it's probably cause on the tip of my tongue now too, I'm reading mortal engines, which is a, um, a book from John Hoberman on the history of, of, of sport and how it does not connect to, to health and fitness in multiple different ways. And, um, so it is probably just, you know, ringing in my ears that uh, if we were just to go the route and, and say, what does fitness look like and change a whole different continuum of fitness and how it connects to people's longevity. And then over here say, this is sport is not about health. Then we'd be, we'd be great. But we've somehow said, you know, it's okay. You know, you can, you can compete and you can live long and prosper. And it's like the more and more people put time and effort into that, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't come out like that. So. Well, James, that's a, I've never heard of that book before, but it looks like you have a ton of books behind you. Uh, just that, and yeah, it's just for show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, so I'm going to test on this. Specifically for podcasts and when we do meetings. <laughs> you know. Obviously, I don't mean to cut in, but uh, me and Danny are putting on a different show. He's got his dirty clothes. And uh, I have this this whiteboard with funny little quotes and padding on the wall. So I don't know what that says about us individually, but uh, it's a very interesting uh, point there. Uh, Dan, I didn't mean to interrupt, buddy. Well, you guys are not afraid of the truth, and I'm afraid, you know, I'm afraid of the fact that I don't know anything. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of uh, reading and books. I think it's just, you know, one of the, the cheapest ways to just learn and grow. And, uh, and you know, you're for you, and, and there's a bunch of them back there, so – if if you could pick one training book that athletes or coaches should read and then one kind of personal development, you've already kind of touched on business already. Um, you know, what, what two books would you pick one bit, one, uh, you know, kind of coaching, uh, more kind of performance based and then one personal development. What would you pick? Yeah. Um, I'll honor the late Mel Sith and say super training. Um, the guy dedicated a whole lot to, you know, of his life to a, an area that a lot of people didn't get to see. Um, really the, his, or he didn't get to see the fruition of that and how it transcended a whole bunch of coaches over time. So I think, uh, I owe him a big, uh, thank you by recommending his book. Um, and then personally, wow, that's a, I'm, I'm, I'm big into the behavioral stuff. So I go with, uh, the values factor, Demartini, John Demartini values factor. Values factor. And what is that about? Uh, basically just aligning up your priorities and what you believe to be your values are and in what you do and why you live your life and how you can align everything up to work towards those things. I think people generally get that consciousness or that awareness in place. It, it really, and they create you know, like ownership to it and don't judge it. And, uh, then they of course tell everyone else about it. It kind of just allows things to work for you effectively. Um, so that'd be a good one. So I want to go back to, um, two questions ago and, and, you know, in our, in our interview with CJ, we kind of brought up the development of coaches and you in that last question a few bits ago talked about the coaching education piece. And, and I've come across a ton of coaches, including a few that we've interviewed on this podcast, um, Carl Harwick, you know, CJ, Ben Benson, you know, and lots of folks who have been under your umbrella, your, your coaching course and, and the development of OPEX. Where, where did the idea and the inspiration to say, hey, these CrossFit coaches or these strength and conditioning coaches, we have this functional fitness animal. Um, where was the inspiration coming from to say, hey, we need to get a coaching system together to, um, to manage this and to grow these people um, so they can be effective coaches and not, you know, in my mind, I think what you're getting into this whole sport and fitness piece, not just, spe- not just sporting people into the ground, right? So, um mm-hmm. So, so talk to us about just the inspiration for your whole coaching model and, and, and why you think it's so important to educate coaches. Yeah. Um, well, first, it uh, I think like a lot of things, they arise from uh, just listening. So I used to, um, you know, train a lot of people, you know, individually um, and then coach coaches who are amongst me and my businesses and then coach people online. And then over time, um, with awareness of like, you know, what the hell am I doing as a coach? What is my career? What does it look like? What am I really going to have a, um, a lasting legacy, um, of feeling really good about what I do every day and being inspired around that. So you start asking questions as you start developing these businesses and helping other coaches, you start asking questions like what the hell is it that I do or have done that if I was to package it or create, you know, a component of teaching other people about it, um, that I was already in my language where I was telling everyone every day, but I was like, oh, you just need to do this and you got to test that and you got to put this in, you know, I actually like, well, why, why don't I just like get these people together um, and then get them together on a weekend and cert and certify them in what I would believe to be great starting points for education. And so I look back and said, there's aspects of a coach's, um, you know, profession that I think I could give them what we call principles. So basic principles of all these areas. So principles of assessment, principles of program design, principles of nutrition, principles of lifestyle coaching, and principles of business. And if coaches left, you know, in my head, if they left with me after a weekend in each of those areas, I felt really good about the fact that they would be able to go out, get into the trenches, and do good shit with people within fitness. Um, And that's where the inspiration came from, really, to start that process up. As far as education for coaches, it's a long answer, but really it's just, it's just needed without getting like, without telling the whole story, you know, up to that point, it's just, it, it, there's a place in the market that requires that, um, with the, 
with everyone's knowledge that fitness and health, as well as preparation for sport, is such a key thing, there actually just isn't enough people to handle the amount of education that's required in order to do that. Um, and that's simply because the profession came about like maybe in the early 90s of the personal trainer or the strength conditioning coach. And then over time, this free market of fitness where everyone can do it, um, there's the, the people in the market that are actually looking for some guidance on it. And that's where, you know, um, institutions and, and corporations got on top of it. I was like, oh, geez, everyone's looking for this uh, coach or health and fitness trainer. We should probably create our own ID on that. Um, and so I went through all those certifications and all that learning and followed all those people. And then over time kind of said, well, what are all those things that I learned and how can I put it together in my own little package that like pulls all of it together that if a coach was to learn it, I would save them 15 years of like digging through those pieces to kind of get some, some peace. Um, so that's why I think the education aspect is really important for those coaches, um, today. Well, the first the first module in that is assessment. So, when you uh, look at an athlete, all right, when you let's say you have an athlete that's that wants to do CrossFit, which seems like it would it encompasses so much, it seems like maybe it's one of the harder things to assess for. So, you know, what what are the main components that you're going to assess, and um, and and you know, and is there a specific order in which they need to be assessed as well? Yeah, well, my assessment that I get uh, you know coaches to understand and go through is not really a CrossFit assessment per se. Um, it's a balanced fitness assessment. So uh, we get people to look at body composition. Uh, we get people to look at movement um, in an analysis of right to left balance. And we get people to look at um, where they start on their exercise program by what their actual physical movement abilities are currently. Um, and then we test them in work capacity, simple work capacity testing that, you know, people will be able to say, oh, this is where you're where you need some improvements. Um I've spent lots of time, well, I guess since 2007, coaching people in the sport of CrossFit. And it's only over the past couple of years with the growth of our number of people that are participating with us in an online and in-person setting of CrossFit that we've actually developed these kind of, you know, guidelines or rules as to what we want to have people be able to do in order to participate in the, in the sport of CrossFit. So like you probably may, I don't know your guys' backgrounds, but like you know for um, – you know, predictors of success and also, you know, field testing for specific sports, it doesn't look anything like FMS or it doesn't look anything like, you know, what you would learn in NSCA for testing. Why? Because those two are basically just trying to look at, you know, just specific roundabout ideas as to what, how people do in movement or conditioning, but the sport itself needs its own testing. And so we do have some specific tests that largely say, you're going to be more successful or not, or these, this is where you, this is where you sit in this realm. And these are the improvements that you need to make. So I'm not sure if that, that adds to more questions or, um, if it, uh, if it really answered the question you're looking at. Danny, anything? No, no, it, no, it answers it. The, uh, okay. yeah, the, I think the, the assessment, the assessment piece is so interesting in, in my opinion, in particular, what you had said, about um, movement right to left. Can you can you kind of expand on that? What do you, what do you mean by that in particular? Yeah. So uh, how how people uh, move from right side to left side. It's a kind of a quasi English osteopath Gary Gray, um, you know, analysis of how people move in space from right to left side. Um, scratch test is included in that too, which you'd know from FMS. Um, right to left movement around the hips. Right to left movement around the ankle right to left movement around the thorax and rotation and flexion extension, and then right to left movement around the shoulder. And then from that, I think most coaches can look at that and not create any diagnosis, but say, okay, you have some of these things going on in these movements, patterns from right to left. we got to be cautious of this if we wanted to add load, repetition, um, or anything on top of it. Continue with that assessment piece, and Danny and I were talking pre-show, and he brought up a really cool topic about age and youth and and whatnot. Would you mm-hmm. go? Would 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 your assessments change? Um, are they all movement based, or is there any kind of condition where okay, you know, we're seeing young kids, we're seeing teens coming into this sport. We have our middle-aged guys. You know, you have visectomized gents like myself who love weightlifting, and then you know you got your masters athletes. So, uh, <laughs> is is that piece ever taken into account when you develop an assessment, or is it all movement and energy based? Yeah, well, when you develop an assessment, um, you have to do it with everyone. So that, that's my perspective. So it doesn't mean that you're going to glean the same results or the same data from all those people. But 
you have to actually use the consistent aspect for everyone in order to say where people should or should not go with the program. I think you have to use, you know, social development, um, education, physical development, education, uh, you know, things like that to dictate what the person is going to be doing for training. Um, but there's no reason why you can't put, you know, a 13 year old through a physical movement assessment and then recognize, okay, well, their spine is not, is not at full length and full, you know, ability at this point in time and their femurs are like this and their feet and hands are gangly, it's still great to do the assessment, but you have to, of course, then change up the training program relative to what you see and also recognize that in five years we you do with them again, it's also great to go back and look at that previous assessment and say, this is what's changed over that period of time. So um, I still ask all the coaches to still do that entire, you know, layout of the assessment, even if it doesn't, you know, uh, gleam anything from it. It's just the fact of repeating the same consistent shit over time and then watching the trends as to how things change with what you know in the background of your coach. Well, what's your stance on uh, on asymmetries and and uh, both from a standpoint of mobility and or strength, uh, in, in particular with athletes that do want to do some of this functional fitness but come from a, a sport background of something like uh, baseball or tennis or something that's very one-side dominant? How do, how do you approach an athlete like that? Yeah, well uh... – we got to look at what their uh, goals are. So if their goals are to participate in the open, you know, and just kind of participate as opposed to, you know, they having the baseline ability. If we're talking about CrossFit as a sport, um, then we have to really figure out what their, you know, ability levels are within the sport first. Because if someone comes in and has those asymmetrical issues for whatever reason, and the chance of them being competitive or being able to actually do the sport is slim to none, well, then we're not even having a conversation of, the same repetitive patterns under load without them having that great right to left balance. Now, if someone does have quote unquote ability and they're not too far off from what that base level requirement is for the participation in the sport, um, then we have to do a lot of work around um, isolating into integrating, um, you know, making sure that they have uh, the baseline requirements as to what's required for all the movements that are this, that are very sport specific. And if they don't have all those things that are needed, um, then we have to work on that. And until we get that, then we can't move them forward in terms of the characteristics of what's required in the sport uh, for those repetitive patterns that they would need to have, which asymmetries, which of course would cause a problem with because it's be spitting off energy uh, all the time or just creating compensatory issues, um, you know, after that. So the asymmetry piece is interesting and obviously would fit into this program design element that that famously your coaches come out of and, and toss out some of the great programming. I know my background before I got into CrossFit was strength and conditioning. And when I first, you know, being a part of CrossFit 808 and CJ doing our programming for us, it was the first CrossFit programming where I saw, okay, there's elements of strength and conditioning here. There, there's a system here. He, he's, he's, he's got a goal for us here, not just whooping our ass. And I always mm -hmm. thought it was interesting. And, and even talking with CJ, he, he mentioned to us, you know, the price of admission, and I tend to agree with him, he thinks is strength. When, when you get into this program design piece, and, and we all know that all things aren't created equal in terms of athletes, um, but let's say we find that one where they are. Where would you, where would you take program design, and if folks had to prioritize um, one element that would move them forward in this functional fitness game, what would it be? It'd probably be bodybuilding. Um, I think that, you know, what I look at on that, on that whole area of participation for CrossFit, if we're talking about that as a sport, is that if, if it's not just about participation, so like, because anyone could do CrossFit, right? You could pull anyone off the street and just say, do that barbell and go like this and do this. Like, hmm. oh, there you go, CrossFit. So it's not about participation. It's it, them being able to own the workout or or them pacing it perfectly, or them getting the correct scoring on it, or for them making progressions, or for them actually fucking recovering from it so they can actually do another workout. So in order to set people up for that, um, yeah, you do need base level, um, what I would say, uh, neural control first. So if someone comes in and, and like, let's say broad base starting out and don't have anything, you have to build from motor control first. So it's not it's not that they lack the time to do snatch maxes. They can't even work against their own body weight, you know? So how do you develop the ability for them, you know, in, in two, two years to five years to be able to snatch consistently on the minute with intensity and fatigue that turns into an opens workout six months later, 
you need a whole shit ton of repetitions, right? Because the main limitation for people starting out is not that they can't lift heavy enough, is that they haven't done enough reps. So with repetition creates motor control. When you build motor control through muscle endurance, it allows you to do more variances in tension, which I call strength endurance. My, my naming of it is slightly different than others, which builds into maximal development. Because our, our thought process on strength training has always been the max goal, which is one repetition. But that's been so, so, excuse my, my language on it, but so elitist weightlifting, powerlifting based that has fucking no consequences to what happens in real world fitness, which is you need to do reps and motor control for fucking years hmm. before you should be actually doing max repetitions. It's not that you can't do a max, is that you're fast tracking the nervous system to do it way too often before it needs to develop this repeat, repeatable quality pattern through muscle endurance and through strength endurance before you do maxes. And that is not a fucking sexy program. <laughs> it's not easy to sell that. You know, people are like, oh, I want to do that. It's that's like, right. well, that's going to take you five years of reps. So I call it bodybuilding because it, it kind of shocks people. But really, it is. It's like it's motor control activities head to toe. Um, that basically get people into these movement patterns much more efficiently. It allows the joints to work effectively. It tells the tendons and the muscles and the brain to all do this at these kinds of tensions. And you can just add to it over time. And ironically, all the successful people have done that for years. Hmm. You know, no one, no one investigated that story, but a lot of those people have done that for years. Well, if, let's say you had to pick one of two athletes. One just cock strong moves like crap the other one uh moves great but it's weak which would you rather have just to try to train them to be competitive in uh in a functional fitness kind of crossfit setting um could i get a little bit more information on the weak guy <laughs> uh, uh, like uh, okay sure joe's his dad <laughs> he's, yeah he so so by sure. joe being his dad he's got subpar genetics <laughs> Um, he's got some Eastern European in him that may, you know, halt his, his cognitive, you know, you know, whatever from picking up new movements. But no, honestly, I think, so I think, um, I guess we're getting into maybe, because famously when I've talked to other coaches, you're always guys are trying to build the avatar, right? So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. so, so uh, maybe Danny, what kind of athletes this weak guy? What kind of sport did he play? Maybe tennis? Or, yeah. Well, all I need to know is yeah. training aids. Cause the way I see things okay. in my head. 18. Oh, sorry. 18, both, both of them 18. Okay, but uh, they, they've done no sports and no training. None. Oh, I take the weak guy fucking any day. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Why, elaborate. The, guy, the guy moves well. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny because that's what Glenn Penley said. He said the same thing. Exactly. All right, okay. I like it. There's hope for us weak guys. <laughs> that's good. So what if you, you don't have compensatory patterns built up over 15 years, that's different. Yeah, I, I, I see that. You know, and, and um, I, if you're although high, if you've got a high training age, and you basically told your nervous system, this is stress on the physical system for 12, 15 years. And it wasn't necessarily perfect movement, but you've been trying to stress the system, right? And that's like relationship stress, food stress, work stress, sleep stress, physical stressors. And you kept doing it. You are so close to your maximal potential that even if you move well, but you're weak, your chance of getting stronger fucking slim to none. Just because you had you hit your nervous system so frequently uh, over that period of time. The only way you're progressing in that is living in the woods and hitting yourself with exogenous hormones. That's the only way you're going to get better from that. You, you talk about stress, and it was a topic that came up. And, and even, again, going back to the CJ interview, he's a contemporary of yours, and he's someone who, who ha obviously has a lot of respect for you. And he talks about how at one point you told him, hey, you care a little too much, right? And mm -hmm. and folks who are stressed and they have all this thing going off their life, I, I know that the whole element now, especially with CrossFit growing in volume, it's becoming a sport where you have to manage the recovery outside of the training as well. So what is your advice on that? And, and just to take this away from training, but how do you how do you manage life? And how do you say, hey, you know, 40-year-old guy who used to be competitive, if you really want to be competitive in the next five years, you need to get your shit together, right? So, so, so – the, the life management outside of training, how are you um, prioritizing, you know, folks getting their shit together so they can train and get gains? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we would hope, we're making assumptions, but we'd hope they'd find the sport participation really important, you know, first of all. 
because we have to line that up. You know, do you actually want to improve? Do you really love the sport? Are you in the culture? Do you know the champions? Do you know your competitors? Are you on Instagram? Are you on CrossFit Games website? Do you know the exact dates? Have you lined up your training for the entire year for that competition? Have you told your wife? Have you told your loved one? Have you told your kids? Have you told your gym? Have you told your work? All those questions, if they answer no to all that, that's a pretty fucking you know, simple prescription. You it's like care. you actually have no actions showing your commitment to what you say you're going to commit to. So I really don't give a shit if you're 48 or 32 or 23. If you answer all those questions with like, yeah, I'm, I've got it all locked in. This is very important to me. Then my job as a coach is just to manage what I call the stress bucket is like how many things are going into that and what's your level of resilience that's going to allow us to push more in it or take shit away to allow the organism to adapt and overcome and to keep on improving. And so that may be, you know, I got to pull out of food inflammation or you got to get divorced or you got to like <laughs> let go of a kid or whatever the case may be. But I'm um, jokingly, but you got to pull away something that allows us to put stuff in, you know, which is training and consistency and improvements on, on the organism. And uh, so that's how I try to align it. I, you know, with my experiences, I'll look at the whole big picture and say, you know what, this is the linchpin right here. If you remove that, you're going to have all these things that you're going to be able to do for it. And then we just try to pick on that, you know, and, uh, and help it. We talk about inflammation and, you know, one of the things that I want to bring up with you from a, from a coaching standpoint is, um, you know, what do you have your athletes do from a kind of leading indicator standpoint in terms of, are, do you have them do blood test work? If so, you know, how often do you have them doing that? Or are there any other kind of testing, uh, you know, options out there that you like your athletes to look at that probably could be generally for, I mean, the general public could probably do, uh, you know, pretty well by looking at these as well. Yeah. So I have a, a fairly steep history in, you know, just the testing of it. Cause I went through it myself to discover how, you know, how I kicked the shit out of my gut through those bodybuilding days of varying different diets and trying everything on the market, uh, in order to see what, uh, the physical, this physical specimen could handle. Um, and I fell, you know, in, in hands with my doc, Dr. Jeff Trabot, who's a, uh, naturopathic physician, who's really deep into biological medicine. So it's real, it's real science steeped and science based. And I was like, okay, that, that kind of, you know, rings well for me. Um, so then I did all of his education basically, or followed him around for a couple of years, learning all the shit he was learning in, in naturopathic medicine, um, to basically get to this point of trying to validate what I was seeing happen in front of clients. Cause it'd be, I always use a simple example of training someone and you give them the right food and they're doing the right lifestyle and everything's right. Then they come back and their body fat's higher and they're feeling more inflamed and they're tired. It's like, you know, what, what the fuck is that? So then you start recognizing that there's a whole other host of things that are going on inside of that, that me as a trainer, I have no connection to. So I went down this road of becoming a functional diagnostic, uh, nutrition practitioner, uh, learned it, had other coaches around me who were starting to test now other people, especially within CrossFit, which are basically, um, labs. And, uh, we put hundreds and hundreds of people through that, um, only to recognize really that in the end, if they're coming to us with problems, then they clearly don't even need to have lab work necessarily. And ironically, the ones that were the greatest within the sport or even continually progress, there's nothing that we did with them that would made any difference in the lab work or changes that they weren't already doing within their current lifestyle habits. So to get back to the answer to your question, I don't think there's any, you know, really a benefit to people in the sport for, for lab testing. If they do require lab testing, they either have had like a traumatic incident that went on, um, or they have some real heavy shit that's happening. That's uh, causing an issue. Otherwise the athlete will, you know, are resilient enough, um, where they just get into these new levels where what you see inside of that athlete, cause we've tested them all is a really sick beat up individual, but resilient as shit. So I don't need to look at those labs and, and tell, you know, a competitor that you have a depressed cortisol, you got the testosterone of a 65 year old man and, uh, your, you know, nighttime melatonin is the shit. What am I going to do with that? You know, I can't, I can't, I can't do anything that's going to change any prescription on that. They just going to need to eat good, you know, change their sleep hygiene, you know, maybe change the macros up a tiny bit, improve food hygiene, but I really can't do anything about it. And funny as shit. 
these people are still progressing and they're still getting better. So what do I do with those labs? Uh, I kind of just looked at them just to kind of validate what I, what I knew was like, yeah, these fucking people are aging very quickly, mm. but there's a reason why they're good at the sport. Uh, because fitness, elite fitness is right next to sickness, right? People think elite fitness is on the other side of sickness, but fit, elite fitness is right here. Sickness is right here. Disease is here. Death is here. Vitality is way the fuck over there is on that side. Yeah. So what am I going to offer these people to answer your question for lab testing? Nothing. Like what, what do I, I don't need to do anything over here. That's going to help change their programming. It's such an interesting, really, if I was to change it, I'd probably make them worse. How fucked up is that? Yeah, it's a us humans. <laughs> us humans are a, a complicated equation, right? I mean, I mean, like you said before. I mean, you could have the perfect program for people, and all of a sudden, you know, they're going to have a personal situation, or you know, they get their girlfriend pregnant or whatever, and they'll screw it completely up and it's super stressed throughout the wall. And uh, it brings up this idea of resiliency. Again, it's super complicated, and I can tell you from a particular standpoint, as soon as stress in my life started to pick up. Um, I had to kind of take some things away because the resiliency just it just wasn't there to recover. Um, and with you saying not really attacking this with lab work, do you have some consistent kind of a uh, questionnaire approach or some kind of obviously there's some assessment you're going to do there. Is it just a basic questionnaire kind of multiple choice questions? Are you in, in contact with your athletes all the time? How do yeah. you figure out you know what are these indicators that? Um, you know, this guy's going to be completely out of his mind for the next week. I need to kind of back off training or he's, he's dialed in. I can push it. Right. Yeah. The chaos of CrossFit has really not yeah. allowed us to cre really create a, <clears throat> a question and answer on that. Um, we've tried, uh, we went down the, uh, BioForce route where we had 60 plus athletes of mine for, um, a number of months go through HRV, you know, methods of, uh, of measurement. And, uh, I didn't really see a lot from it to be completely honest. I think the, I think the CrossFit athlete is a different breed where they try to keep this tonus all the time. And that's what actually allows them to stay consistent within what's required within the sport. <clears throat> so we, I don't have a actual readiness, but I do. Um, of course we do train one-to-one. -one. We don't have templated programs and there is one coach to one client, um, within the sport. So, uh, we basically allow what we do have control over, which is repeatable work and measures in training to dictate how people are doing. Um, so we have, you know, things that they have to do within a training session, within a week. Um, and that could be in different energy systems or in different strength pieces that if we see any little like red flag from what's expected in that, then that gives us a, uh, a little point of questioning on uh, what's going on and how the system's moving forward. We bring up stress and, and I think it's, a huge component of well anybody's life for that matter. But one of the modules that you have, you know, uh, in your um, your training course is a is a life. Uh, what do you it's called? Life, not life coaching, lifestyle coaching. I believe it is. Um, so so, what's so important about that? You know, and in particular, do you feel like it's a it's a big missing link in a lot of coaches and and how they actually help facilitate changes long term with people. Uh, so yeah, quick answer is yes. I think it is missing link. Um, it came about because <clears throat> I look back, as I said, from, you know, the experiences that I had and I saw all the missing pieces, you know, where things went wrong and looked at, you know, my issues as a person and the problems that I had with coaching and the biases that I was bringing to the table. And I started to look, look back and recognize that it was that relationship between me and the client and this little space right here. That was really magical um, that, you know, from whatever practices I, had, you know, got it from, whether it just being, you know, because I did have some actual practices of uh, what's called professional fitness and lifestyle consulting through the Canadian side of exercise physiology. Um, and I just used that to develop my own kind of routine of what kind of questions I'd ask. Um, and then, of course, you know, other, let's call it uh, learnings down the road, I started to recognize the magic part of all of the relationships I had that were quote unquote successful, whatever that was. And the meaning of that success in my mind was when I developed a great relationship with the client. So, uh, however, you know, you know, that has to be done. I really don't think you're going to great create whatever success means fulfillment for the coach or improvement for the athlete. If that relationship is not a good one where the coach says, this is where I sit. And the client says, this is where I sit. Now, how do we put shit in the middle, not judge it, but just kind of work together to try to make things move forward? 
Um, and that's what our lifestyle coaching course does. It basically helps the coach work on themselves for the first day and know all the shit that they come into it with and what their biases are and what their issues are with awareness and consciousness and things like that. And then the second day, we focus on helping these people uh, align with the right kind of questions um, to also stay in the coach's lane, but also to derive this strength of a relationship so that uh, someone, as an example, you can get on, you know, in a consultation with a CrossFit athlete and they're sitting down and they're saying all these things to you. Um, and you're just like, oh, yeah, 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 for sure. That's exactly, yeah, for sure. Okay, I gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But you've never asked any questions like, how did you get here? What do you do every day? You know, what lights you up? What inspires you? All those things. You start asking those questions and now you're like, yeah, all that shit you talked about is not even important to you. You're just saying it to try to impress me. And you keep forgetting that the reason why we're here is this. And we can still do all the flashy CrossFit shit, but the, the reason why you're doing what you're doing is right here. So I'd rather get to that truth and build that with people. And that's what we teach coaches to get to so that we can have fun with the magic of the stuff that's over here. Yeah, the, the building relationships piece is interesting. And to be honest, you know, I was always reluctant to get into this online coaching format because I didn't think you could build real personal relationships through it. But the more I do it and the more I tweak my process, you really can get into people's – I mean, I'm kind of working with a guy from England right now who's a soldier trying to get ready for a PT test. And he's like 45 and he wants to just be able to do things with younger kids. It's just amazing to me that you can learn about folks. And I, I really think if you mix some brains and some art and – and some good science and a, and a decent assessment that you like. And honestly, the piece that matters most is if you care about each other. If you care about the person, if you care about the athlete, um, I think you're going to end up finding the best way. And um, I think, again, being consistent with that. What do you your, – your, your idea on that and developing this consistency with a coach and athlete – what are mm -hmm. what are some tips or tricks, you know, working from a distance and getting into this online relationship that you could pass on to coaches who are kind of exploring this online model? And how, how might you, say, build that relationship in that kind of online setting? Yeah, um, well, um, I could just take it from the playbook of what we're doing consistently uh, today, which uh, um, is a business that's had success in building that um, that online presence. Um, you have to set up constructs of the process so that the client coming in knows exactly what that relationship is going to look like. So uh, to answer your question, if, if that coach is interested in doing online coaching, um, then they have to recognize some principles in consistency of the relationship have to be in place of their service offering hmm. before they actually go looking for that client to bring them in. So we, we have, you know, um, Fitbot, which is a technological uh, component of keeping communication between client and coach. Um, and that client knows coming in, that's going to be our form of communication. And they also know they're going to get this, you know, uh, every two weeks, three weeks or four weeks. Um, and so if that's laid out for people, it's, it's pretty easy to like, you know, wrap everything around it, to try to create that consistency, both in the program and, and the things that are important in the relationship. And um, like you said earlier, which I, I tweak a little bit, to go back to CJ's point, it's not about it's not about the depth of care. Um, it's about the the caring of the relationship, right? So it's not that you, it's not that you're trying to care so much about the client. You care about the relationship. So if you truly care, the the highest form of caring is actually detached caring. If that makes sense. What is detached caring? I I I don't think I quite follow. What is that? Yeah. So you're, you know, if you think about the building of a relationship and I like to, you know, use it as an example, someone comes into your gym right away and take all those things out of your head. You're like, I got to keep them because they're going to be paying me and do all these things for them. It's like, no, I, I care about like you not fucking hurting your knee or tripping up over that bench, mm -hmm. you know, and I care that you're going to do your exercises correctly because um, I want this to work. And I, I'm going to remind you about water on the way out because I care about you being consistent and getting good sleeps and, and things like that. Um, but there's a level of caring that goes beyond that. And that's, that's a level of caring in which you're just giving them advice because you are fulfilled as a coach to give education and to pass on what you know in your head that comes through to that client. And they get value because they get that information, which improves themselves as a human being. Um, the detached caring aspect is, is letting go of that education and then just going like this, boom, it's over. So what they do with that is up to them. Overcaring is when I taught them that and they're like, yeah, I got it. And now you're watching them on the way out and you're watching <laughs> them in their car and then you're texting them like, are you still drinking your water? 
And then you check in with them at night and then the next morning they don't do their exercise. You're like, oh, fuck, that's me. I didn't give them the right, you know, service to kind of, that's called overcaring. So from the outside, it looks like, oh, wow, they care so much. Uh, actually, you're being a burden to the relationship because they have to develop self-responsibility. So detached caring is education with the right kind of care in mind for the relationship. And then it's just, it's done. Their self-responsibility now to follow orders, to do what they want to do with their exercise program, to create, you know, um, self-awareness for themselves. Well, to me, it kind of makes sense. To me, it seems like to sum it up, it seems like that hovering parent, you know, eventually you got to let your kids leave the nest, right? You can't just, you you don't want to be over your 40 year old kid wondering if they're brushing their teeth, tucking their bed in, doing all that stuff or washing their underwear. So I mean, I did that in personal training for years to make money. Fuck that. Or I'm done with that. (laughs) It's even like a, you know, I was, I was a waiter for years in college and, there's the worst thing you can do is stand like come back too often. <laughs> yeah. You guys good? You guys want some more water? Want some more bread? Like they're be like get the hell out of here. Get no yeah. tip. You know, it's <laughs> like leave me alone, buddy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so uh, that's, that's interesting. And, and you know, I, one thing I, I did want to ask you about, I and I think you have kind of a unique uh, experience with this because it sounds like so you've built you know a brick and mortar business. You had actually like you know physical employees, phys- hands-on with people, things like that. And then uh, now online, uh, which one was more challenging for you? Oh, the and, online. And why? Is, oh, the online one for sure. So the, cause I think the brick and mortar one was built many times over with other colleagues of mine back in the day. Um, yeah. the, the online system was just like, <clears throat> you know, a call out for help of people that wanted to participate in the sport they're like, oh, OPT, you won. You must know what you're doing. Well, you know, how can you help me? I was like, uh, well, I have this monthly online service. That, <laughs> you know, and then uh, people all over the world are like, you know, trying to trying to congregate with me and like giving that service. And then it grew. And anyway, no, it created created a lot of mistakes and did a lot of shit wrong. And and because the whole world of remember uh, online coaching years back was with, was with a shit base of technology, right? But the technology base is massive today. Um, which is causing another problem to it, but but it's a uh, it's allowed anyone to do it, which is the other problem to it. Um, but you can you can get you know like you just mentioned your story of the guy in Britain. Excuse me if I'm wrong where he was, but yep. I mean that's that's fucking powerful shit, right? Us as humans can connect with someone on the other side of the earth, uh, talking to him over Skype. They're talking about their life, what's going on in Brexit, you know how the how they eat food. I mean. <laughs> imagine the you know, but think about it. Imagine the learning you're going to get as a coach if you get those opportunities for it. So. That whole system to build that to, has taken, honestly, you know, eight years of a lot of work because I had to not just build it, to, you know, uh, in a process that's going to make me successful. I wanted to build it because I really didn't feel like like in my old previous business that if I didn't build it so others could come in and do this fun shit with me, then um, it was not going to be successful. And we're finally at that point where the, the business is in an awesome spot. We've got a great top-down uh, infrastructure. We've got, you know, future goals. Just got it. It's rocking. So it's taking a long while. Well, you bring up business and, and your business is rocking. You feel like you're in a good place with it. And you kind of just getting into a little bit of business at the end of this chat, kind of, we hit all the modules. It's pretty, pretty fluently. We've kind of gone through what you're doing over at OPEX. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of great coaches. We got a lot of people who are good athletes and, you know, there are some folks who care about people out there. And sometimes we get all that in one person. But lots of times you'll see that these coaches who have all that going, they'll get into the business world and they'll screw it all up, right? Um, So folks who are trying to coach and then develop that business, uh, a a takeaway to start that journey, a takeaway to that first step that they need to do to get their um, shit together um, so they don't have to spend eight years doing it, right, Like, like you had. I mean, it seems to me like that's your process too. I mean, we go back to the whole training module. You were saying, well, how can I streamline 15 years of learning into a weekend, into a course. Um, let's get into the business a little bit and just maybe that first step because, again, it's a, it's a huge piece. Yeah, and especially if there's one area or a trade that is the absolute shits um, of, of, the, of, of unbelievable trade uh, and skill capabilities, which would be the strength coach, and then absolute shit business practice. It's sure. our trade. Like there's other, there's other trades. I would even argue physical therapy was, is kind of like that, but they have at least acumen of like, you know, connection and money and how it works and whatnot. Coaches are the shits on top of that. And I think why is cause in the, like we talked about 
they really do care so much about the relationship and are so inspired by fitness. They just think it's all going to work out. Um, and so they have the great heart and, you know, mentality, but they just have none of those, you know, things in place. So what would those things be for people who are starting out? Um, I'll, I'll just use my own personal example. you got to look around at other examples of successful businesses in different ways through service offerings, retail, online, and really understand just the business practices itself. And then talk about little things like margins and profit and overhead and simple shit like that. Because if you go outside of your little bubble and look at other businesses, there's a lot of systems that make sense for any product delivery and how it's offered. And then when it comes down to your own personal one, you have to talk about things that are really like front end, like what is going to be the cost of the service you're providing and then how much of your time and effort is going to go into that to cover what you're going to be making for the value of the service you're providing. And a lot of people forget that. They're just like, oh, 150 bucks a month because that's what people do. We'll just get 150 members and it just rolls like this. Hmm. And the next thing you know, they're like, holy shit, I'm working 80 hours a week. I'm actually making only about eight bucks an hour and I'm paying these people, you know, 20 bucks to do a class and they're volunteers and I get 50% retention of those coaches, 50% retention of those clients and it turns into a shit show. All that shit would have been cleared up if they went back and said, what are all the things that I need to have in place to make this work, not just for a year, but for three, five, and 10 years. And even if you don't have the answers to that, by asking those questions though, it'll be like dingling up here in the back of your head. Um, on top of that, if you want to do, you know, some more, you know, um, I get deeper business practice advice, um, you know, then you're probably gonna have to go elsewhere for that specific service. But uh, I think those would be things to start with for folks. Well, I think you just exploded some people's heads there listening to this because, uh, I mean, that's that's just phenomenal advice. And and I, I talk to a lot of CrossFit gym owners. I'm just, you know, I, there's a lot of them in Atlanta and, and a lot of them send people to see me. So I chat with a lot of them about it. And what you're describing is so accurate in terms of the, I guess, the mentality when they go into it. You know, they look at these rough numbers of, oh, this times this equals, holy shit, I'm going to make $45,000 a month. And, <laughs> and you're like, wow, I'm going to be killing it. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, wait a second, overhead and taxes and all these other things that they don't think about whatsoever. Um, and then, and then try to scramble to change it, you know? So, uh, for me, and, and if anybody's out there that's, that is, uh, in this situation or is like looking to start a business, um, I was, uh, recommended a really re good book. It's called E-Myth Revisited before I started my business, which is, it's all about setting your business up as if you're going to sell it one day. And if you, if you look at it, even though you may not, or, or think about franchising it or whatever it might be, but, but just looking at it, it's really hard to answer those questions and thinking what, you know, what's your vision? What, what do you, what do you want to do? What's a perfect day look like for you? All, all these things that are, um, they're really hard to sit down and write out, but if you do that and it, what it helps is you understand what you're not thinking about, what you're missing in terms of could be a huge problem for you six, 12 months down the line and you're just straight burned out, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, that's phenomenal advice. And, you know, and if somebody is interested in this for, with your, uh, with your program, is it, is it kind of an all or all or nothing? Hey, take all these modules or not, or if somebody's interested in the business itself or how does that work? If, if somebody's interested as well as where can they learn more about it? Because, you know, this is just some phenomenal information. Well, opexfit.com, that'll give you all your info. You can contact Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, opexfit.com if you wanted to ask more questions. But yeah, of course I'm going to say all the modules, not because it's a money play, but I mean, if people just do assessment, it's almost giving you a little taste of something where you're going to go back and look at shit now and be like, oh my God, you know, that's a lot of broken shit that I'm going to have to fix. <laughs> and if you don't, if you don't learn how to prescribe that in a good program design, well, then you're going to be now more frustrated. And then when you can start doing program design, um, you're going to get people like, oh, man, I can't stay consistent. So you, if you didn't learn how to do a consulting practice, then now you're just giving programs and you got no relationship building. And now you're developing a relationship and, you know, a month down the road, they're like, I just want to lose that extra little bit of body fat or I want to prepare for this competition. And you're like, uh, I'll just look for an online nutrition program. Well, no, you know, CCP Nutrition can take care of that as well. And then like in your case, people get into that trouble over a period of time, get surrounded by all these people. They're like, this shit's awesome. And then bills are coming in and people are leaving. You're like, oh, fuck, it's a business. It'd be great to have that business acumen also. So you're eventually going to have to do all of them. So that's why I say just jump in full force. It's four to $5,000, multiple different payments to finish the entire level one. Um, I guarantee you at the end, if you're a coach that um, I'll even say, I'll give you your money back if you don't feel like you're satisfied because most people who finish it 
least take some shit from it and can persevere in what they're doing for coaching. Um, and if you feel like it's a piece of shit, then of course tell me cause I'd want to fix it, but I can certainly help a bunch of people. So the, the last takeaway question and, um, you know, you don't seem like the kind of guy who's ever completely happy with the process or the product. What What's the next step? I mean, is there anything, is there any other bigger goals for, for OPEX down the line? Um, or is it just kind of tweak and see and uh, just make what you have going better? Yeah, I think that's, uh, your point is true that it's almost been a problem for me um, as a business leader, like his point to Emith and the exit strategy that you should have in the back of your head. Um, I have a problem with that in my head, not a problem with the philosophy, but like, you know, what is the exit strategy? And I know I always need to keep thinking about it because it makes me refine shit that's, you know, important. But I think I'm in a world based upon my head and in fitness where I can't, I can't write a book or create a manual or create a system that's just going to be like, that's it. And then I'm out mm -hmm. because there's so much shit that's always changing to kind of evolve it and make it better and refine it that, of course, that causes a whole lot of problems for my staff and our future of our company because I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not the best, but there's like, we just spent a year and a half trying to get that, you know, online in a package where we could just like turn it over. And I'm like, yeah, 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 but this is better. And so, um, so yeah, I, that's, I'm always at that, that, uh, crux and the change of it, but, um, who, you know, fuck it. You know, that's just my, that's just what I, what I want to do, uh, for it. And I can, I can do it as I wish. I guess that's not a bad way to beat me. I mean, you're just all here is constant progression. And, and in particular, the field does change. You know, this isn't, uh, I don't know, some some sort of uh, trade or something like that, that it's been the same way for hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, medical research changes all the time. Training research changes all the time. And if you don't stay up with that, it's, it's, it's almost the best and worst part about the field is you constantly have to learn and you constantly can learn. But if you don't, then after, you know, it could take a couple of years, but hey, after a couple of years, two years, and you're behind the times, and there's somebody out there that's just reading every night and, and learning new things and practicing, and next thing you know, you know, somebody's better than you. And it's uh, we don't get competition as much as maybe we used to. And for, it sounds like for you and, and for myself as well, my competition is is how, how well I can get my patients better, how, how good of a coach I can be, you know, how business-wise, th same way. Um, so I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Although... Although I do think it's probably just the way you are and, and it probably is going to create some variation of stress in your life or somebody that can just be like, cool, autopilot, I'm moving to Belize. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, um, I can't see that happening. But I uh, I just love the point, love the fact you pointed out that uh, the exit strategy component because uh, I'm always thinking about that to try to make it because I really care about our coaches, right? Because they, they are coaches around the world. Um, and to your point, which I didn't finish on what OPEX, we're going to, we're having gyms now. We've created a licensing opportunity for people to open OPEX gyms. Um, and it's really my next, you know, big adventure of something that I'm super inspired by to make that like, you know, I guess you'd call it levels of impact on the fitness industry. My goal has always been to change the face of fitness. Um, I've done it as a competitor in multiple different ways. I've done it through program design and really questioning the, the how to operate shit. And now I'm going to offer it to coaches who want to actually run it the way that I'd like to have run it in brick and mortar. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Um, but like, as you know, if all those coaches are on board, we have this big wave of movement. I can't like in a year of time, be like, eh, yeah, that shit that you thought was like the way to do that thing. It's going to have to change. Then we had to change it for 2000 people, you know, across the board in terms of what they thought was like the truth. So that's what I meant in terms of like refining and the problems with that. You know, a real simple one is an example, which you'd understand as, as uh, in, uh, in therapy, um, was like we changed this slight arrangement in our assessment from uh, having people lying in a supine position and then lowering their legs and seeing like pelvic motor control based upon how far they can lower their legs down. And we've changed that into like a, just a supine position with a hip raise and looking at right to left and then a, you know, a, a side bridge assessment and and so even that, which are, it doesn't seem like much, but it is a change. So now people are like need to be re you know, re-educated on the movements and, and the assessments and whatnot. So, Well, folks, I think this is a nice re-education and, and a great introduction to the, to the OPEX model. Again, it's been, a, it's been a model that's been discussed multiple times on the podcast. So it's, it's really cool that with, with your crazy busy schedule, James, you're able to make some time with us. And aside from going to um, OPEX.com or excuse me, OPEXFit.com, best way to reach out is, is just going through that website and then just kind of tinkering away? Or, or are you also on other social media platforms where people can check you out? 
Yeah, uh, J Fitzopex um, on Instagram, and um, we can become friends on Facebook. <laughs> um, I just, I just can. On, oh, <laughs> I just got on Facebook like I don't know, like six months ago. I, I think I was one of the last humans ever that uh, that jumped on at 43 years of age. But um, I just kind of stayed away for, 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 away from it forever. Um, and then I want to just keep in more contact with our coaches and our community. So that was a great medium to do it. Uh, but they can hit me up there. Um, I don't mind an email either. Um, you know, I always appreciated uh, Louis Simmons and um, Ian King and Paul Check and those guys always answering questions when I was that pick ass, you know, coach back at the 90s. So uh, James at OPEXFit.com, if you wanted to email me and ask a question, I've never, never not answered any emails that came through. Most people, as humans, recognize they, they can't write stories and want to get a story back, but I'll read everything and answer it as as eloquently as I can. I'll always make time for people who are interested in fitness. Watch out for a Facebook request from Eliza Joe Shamanic. Me and my wife like everything. Uh, we share everything, including a Let's Facebook name and a Skype handle. <laughs> you can see pictures of my rat ass kids tearing my life apart, but we love them no matter what they do. But uh, so, Danny, I think James is doing it. I mean, I think um, this is a, a fired up episode, Danny. Um, any final takeaways before we let James go? No, man, this, this was uh, one of my favorite ones. Guys, if you're listening to this, just rewind it and listen again. There's a lot of, a lot of information in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you're interested in the, in the uh, certification process, every coach that I've worked with that's gone through the certification process is awesome. They just do a really, really good job, in particular on the, the programming assessment side of things. So if it's something you're interested in, take a look at it. Um, it's worth the investment from what I've seen. Cool. Well, gang, Doc Danny, Coach Joe, James Fitzgerald, OPEX Fitness proving that if you have a body, you're an athlete.